Hi, everybody. Um, my name is Maura Farrell. I'm a Rural Geography Lecturer at NUI Galway, and I'm involved in both the Ruralisation Project and the National Rural Network. And I'm absolutely delighted for us to be hosting this online conference together today between ourselves, um, the National Rural Network and the Ruralisation Project. So the title of our online conference today is Facilitating Our Future Farmers National and International Perspectives. I just want to thank you, first of all, everybody for joining us. Uh, sincere thanks to you, the audience, for joining us. I, I'm sure at this stage, a lot of you have had a number of webinars and Zooms and Microsoft Teams and everything else. So our sincere thanks to all of you for joining us this afternoon. I also want to thank our speakers. I'll talk about them and introduce them as we go through each of the presentations, but I want to thank them for giving up their time and for joining us today. I want to thank particularly my colleagues, my own colleagues in the National Rural Network team, um, James Claffey, who's doing a lot of the work in the background for us today, and all of the other people as well involved in putting all of this event together. And I suppose I just wanted to remind you before we start that the event is being recorded and uh, following the event, we will have it up online via the National Rural Network and via the Ruralization Project. And towards the end, we will also take a screenshot of the audience or maybe even the people participating, just so we can use it again for disseminating the event. So I suppose just before we start into the presentations, I just want to remind you that if any of you have any questions, there is a Q&A section at the bottom of your screen, your group, your Zoom screen. So please make sure that you use that and make sure that you um, send in any questions at all that you like. Also, as well as that, I suppose we have a hashtag if you're using Twitter and um, hashtag ruralization uh, underscore H2020. So again, I think it's up on the front of your screen as well at any stage. If you would like to tweet about our event, that would be most welcome. So I suppose just looking at our agenda today and the people that are speaking, we've brought all of these speakers together to really explore how we can enable our future farmers gain access to farmland and the farming sector. One of the key issues that we have right across Europe and most definitely in Ireland at the moment is this idea of how people can access land for farming, people can access land in rural areas for maybe small to medium enterprises, for horticulture, for new ent enterprises that they're engaging in. So also for young farmers accessing land, it is a key issue that is part of our ruralization project and is also part of issues of our concern here in Ireland. So this is one of the key reasons why we've decided to bring these different speakers together today in order to discuss this issue. And I'm going to start, as I've outlined to you already, this project or this proposal is coming to you today, this online event is coming to you today via the Ruralization Project and the National Rural Network. So in starting this, I'm going to discuss a little bit about our Ruralization Project to start. And I want to thank particularly Ashling Murta, who is the postdoctoral research on the Ruralization Project, and Ashling, who would have done a tremendous amount of work on this project already. So Ashling will be speaking later in the event, and but I just want to thank Ashling from the get-go for organizing a lot of the event for today. Now, ruralization really is about the opening of rural areas to renew rural generations and jobs and farms. It's a Horizon 2020 project, and it started in 2018, and we're, uh, I suppose, a year and 18 months or so involved in the project now at this stage. And for my presentation, to tell you a little bit more about the Ruralization Project, I'm just going to give you an overview of the project itself and the perspective of the project, talk a little bit about the group of people that are involved in the consortium, and maybe discuss a little bit of the work packages in the project that will give you a flair for what ruralization is actually all about. So we have 18 partners in the consortium itself. Um, I want to thank and welcome particularly Chagas, who are our other national partner, and Anne Kinsler, who will be presenting after me, is here with us as well today. 
So NUI Galway are one of the main um, partners here in Ireland. And we have other partners as well right across Europe from the United Kingdom, from Finland, Poland, Spain, Germany, uh, and a numerous amount of uh, not just academic stakeholders, but also key stakeholders participating and in many, many different areas of rural development and rural sustainability. So just to give you a quick overview of the actual project and what the project is all about, and this Horizon 2020 call, it came about really in relation to this idea of a European territorial cohesion that really is being threatened. And I suppose it's been threatened by an unequal development of our urban and rural areas. And what do we mean by that? Eurostat indicators will show us that there has been a population growth in the last number of years right across Europe. But they're also suggesting that from 2014 to 2050, there is a huge difference between urban and rural uh, areas population growth. And they're suggesting that by 2050, there is an idea that there would be an extra 12% population in urban areas. However, the population in rural areas may have declined by about 7%. There is a difference as well in the GDP, the, the GDP per head uh, in relation to 2014 figures. And this would show us again that a 34, over 34,000 GDP per head in urban areas, whereas in rural areas, this is down to 19,000. Again, you can start to see this unequalization between urban and rural areas. Again, if you look at this unequalization, you'll start to see that over 50% of EU land is controlled by just over 3% of farms. So this unequalization is really within the agricultural community itself. And again, 70, so over 76% of EU smallest farms really cultivate 11.2% of the EU land, again, showing an unequalization within the rural sector itself. So key issues that are, I suppose, are a huge part of European lifestyle, a huge part of Irish lifestyle, but are also key issues in relation to the ruralization project. And if you look at these, one of the key issues that we are facing, and Shane Conway is going to talk about this in detail in his presentation later on. And what we see is that most EU farmers are over the age of 55 years of age, and we have very few under the age of 35 farmers. Actually, one of the st statistics that appeared in one of our national papers going back about a year and a half to two years ago was that Ireland has more over 90 year old farmers than we have of under 30. So this is, I suppose, a, a really considerable issue that shows we have a much aging population of farmers in uh, Ireland in particular, but also right across Europe. Now, I suppose to deal with this in some way, the 2007 to 2020 um, EU policies, they allocated over 9.6 billion worth of money to aid young farmers and improve competitiveness and generational renewal in particular. However, the Code of Auditors in 2017, um, they did suggest that the EU support is based on a poorly defined intervention logic, and it should be better targeted to foster effective generational renewal, which I suppose in many respects, these policies like um, some of these generational renewal policies, they really show that there has been little impact on rural areas, not providing new opportunities, particularly to young and new generations coming into rural areas. And as a result, you start to see urbanization be, being a trend that has strengthened. And this is where I suppose our ruralization project comes in. And what we are offering in ruralization is a counterforce to this idea of urbanization. So what does ruralization bring to the table? What does this Horizon 2020 project bring to us? What will it bring as far as research is concerned? What will it bring as far as practitioners on the ground are concerned? So the project aims in particular to trigger a process of ruralization. And that is really, I suppose, what we're talking about there is it aims to create a development towards a new rural frontier. And this new rural frontier will bring us new generations that find economic and social opportunities within a rural context itself. It aims then, I suppose, and it will do this particularly by analyzing trends that are already happening in rural areas, 
What are the key issues that are happening between young farmers, new entrants into rural areas, successors, all of these people that really we need in order to create a new generation of people in rural areas. In doing this, it will also make an inventory of rural dream futures between our rural youth people. And I'll talk about this in a few minutes as well. It also aims to study promising practices which enable rural newcomers, new entrants to farming and farm succession. So really sometimes the best way in which we can provide new practices in many rural areas is to look to see what is already working, what are promising practices that we can reignite in different areas across Europe. So the project will do this as well. It will also analyze the rules, the policies and the actions, particularly in and around a focus of access to land. So the outcomes really of the ruralization project, we aim really to discuss these with key stakeholders on the ground. What are the practitioners on the ground saying about the findings of this project and how do they feel that the project can improve different regional rural context? So I suppose upscaling positive experiences would be one way in which we would try and do this. And also jointly formulating novice options for policymakers and practical tools as well for rural actors. So the work plan of how we're going to carry this out and how we're actually carrying this out at the moment in the ruralization project, really we aimed at the very beginning to create a framework for research and innovation. And I'm gonna talk about these steps in a few moments. We also aimed to look at a foresight analysis to identify what are the opportunities in rural areas and how can we facilitate new rural newcomers into rural areas or new entrants into farming and what kind of tools can we provide to ensure that people, particularly newcomers and new entrants to farming, have greater access to land. And in doing all of this, how can we design or make sure that policy is designed and policy is assessed to make sure that it is creating this new form of ruralization. And one of the, way, the greatest ways that we can make sure that all of this work uh, gets to the people who really need it, gets it to the key stakeholders and policy makers is to make sure that we have an effective communication and dissemination process. So really the process of ruralization, this ruralization project, it seeks, I suppose, to understand how we can create this new rural frontier that I've spoken about and where we will have a generational renewal in farming and wider rural society. The process of ruralization also looks at the many opportunities in rural areas that can be created for new generations to make sure that they can build their lives and their livelihoods in rural areas. It also aims this process of ruralization to create opportunities that means that increasingly new generations will stay in rural areas and new newcomers will move into the rural areas that they won't just I suppose um, come in and out of these areas they will actually stay and make their lives in these rural areas. So these patterns will result we hope in a new trend of ruralization and our aim here is that it will weaken and it will create a counterforce to the dominance of urbanization that we see at this current time. And in the initial parts of this work, Inuai Galway was very involved in the initial parts of this work, and we created a conceptual fit framework or how we were going to actually study this, how we were going to look at this, what were the key kind of ideas and concepts that we really needed to look at this. And one of these was this idea of regeneration. And this idea of regeneration, it really responds to rural decline, rural decline that we've all seen in Ireland and right across Europe over the last number of years. And responding to rural decline really enables a positive change and potentially allows us to transform a new generation of rural people with new opportunities. But I suppose alongside this concept of regeneration, we also had other concepts as well that we worked on for this idea of rural regeneration and the ruralization of this project. So I suppose innovation was one of these key concepts that we looked at. And we used innovation, I suppose, to overcome decline. And thinking about this idea that innovation can solve problems and it can be a source of new opportunities that hopefully will support this idea of regeneration in our rural areas. 
Capitals was also an area of the conceptual framework that we looked at, and a range of capitals or resources are key to, I suppose, harnessing the opportunities that are there in rural areas, and also using capitals to overcome the problems that might be there. And these might be something like cultural capital, human capital, environmental capital, and ensuring that these have the capacity to exist, and I suppose to act and to maybe overcome the decline and harness regeneration in rural areas. And in many respects, I suppose, the opportunities created must also be an underpinned, I suppose, by this idea of resilience. And these can support a cycle of renewal. So opportunities must be resilient and they must be able to be sustained to ensure this upward cycle of regeneration and to ensure also that we don't revert to a downward cycle of decline once again. And in looking at that conceptual framework, in UIG we're also involved in an assessment framework. And the assessment tools that we look towards in ruralization were really looking at potential case studies and outlining a set of promising practices through case studies. We also were in assessing our framework, we also looking at uh, regions where we were going to reflect and we're going to look at the development of policies. And we're also going to assess less successful areas within a less successful context. So all of this kind of thinking and assessment framework really underpins the conceptual kind of ideas that we had in and around ruralization. Another work package of ruralization is this idea of a foresight analysis. And this focuses specifically on young people in rural areas. So a foresight analysis has been carried out and it started about a year ago. And it included looking at trend analysis of rural development in rural areas. So population, job structures, what people are involved in. And we created a trend database over all of the 18 partners and also included many other countries right across Europe. And this trend database is continuing to be developed by our, our Finland partner and this will be available in January 2021. And through this, we created an inventory of rural dreams for the future of new generations in rural areas. We will also create or we will also hold 20 regional workshops to make sure that we involve young people in this um, kind of thinking. We've already involved 2000 young people in setting up the trend analysis um, of young people right throughout um, Europe. And we were involved in this work package ourselves here in Ireland and also created this idea of dream futures. This work package will also hold, I suppose, future workshops with key stakeholders in 2021. And in June 2021, Turku in Finland will host a futures conference looking at this idea of future dreams of young people in rural areas. Work package five, I suppose, which looks and which we're concentrating on here today in this idea of rural newcomers and new entrants into farming. And again, through this work package, we looked at case studies of promising practices we look we, throughout Europe, we were looking at 10 case studies on rural newcomers, 10 on new entrants into farming and 10 on successors. And for our successors case study here in Ireland, we were looking at one of the new EIP agri projects, the MOPS project and organics project. So we will carry out a series of interviews via the MOPS project, which again is a wonderful opportunity to look at promising practices of successors and newcomers in rural areas. Through this work package, we'll also carry out what we're going to call confrontations of promising practices within 20 different contexts. And we'll pick particular areas to carry these out. So we will be bringing promising practices to rural areas to see if these practices can be replicated by different areas right throughout Europe. And in doing this, we will create a comparative analysis of the promising practices and maybe the less successful rural areas. Our work package six again, which we're focusing on here today is this idea of access to land. So I suppose in this work package, we created an analysis of the legal and policy arrangements, I suppose of 28 member states. And we selected eight specific arrangements via this. And it looked at the analysis of land holdings and land market trends. And these included prices and capitalization of the cap uh, payments and also access to land markets. It also created, and we carried out expert workshops on policy arrangements and land holdings. 
And again, current and novel innovative practices was really what we were looking at for, for this particular work package on access to land. Focus groups for this will also be carried out right through from August 2021 to March 2022. Our policy contributions via the ruralization projects and our results, this is some of the key ideas that we're hoping to get out of this project. So the project we're hoping will trigger this process of ruralization. And the policy approach to support it really, we're hoping that it will support this idea of rural dream futures and this idea of access to land, new entrance into rural areas and farming and creating a policy approach for all of these issues. It will also design a handbook for policymakers and for good practice guides for policymakers and stakeholders, which is hugely important. Policy assessments and communications of the lessons learned will also be a key part of the ruralization project. Communication and dissemination is imperative for all of these projects and the communication and dissemination of ruralization will come in the form of many different events such as our online event today, but also a massive open online course and webinars which the um, ruralization project will also take part in. We'll also aim to publish some of the work that we're carrying out and make sure that there are online open tools available for anybody interested or any key stakeholders that want to access the work that we're doing. So I suppose just before I finish up on my presentation, what we're trying to do in ruralization is we're trying to create a positive spiral of new rural opportunities. So I suppose through our foresight analysis, through facilitating newcomers, new entrants to farming, through creating tools to provide access to land and ensuring that we have policy development. What we're creating here is more opportunities for new generations through the spiral of new rural opportunities. And by creating new opportunities, we're hoping that more young people will move in and less people will, young people will move out of rural areas. By having this and by this occurring, we will have a relatively younger population in rural areas. And because of this, again, we will have a renewal of population in turn creating more economic activities, thereby creating more opportunities for new generations. So you have this continuous spiral of uh, new opportunities in rural areas. And this is exactly what we're hoping will happen with the Ruralization Project. So I hope I've given you to start off this online um, event today. I hope, I hope I've given you a feel for what the Ruralization Project is about. And I suppose in concentrating on our issues today of young farmers, our issues of access to land, we have a host of speakers who will talk to us about research carried out via the Ruralization Project and via other people, I suppose, via the National Rural Network as well. I'm going to stop my presentation and I'm going to call on our second speaker after myself, I suppose, for this morning, for the afternoon. And I'm going to call on Anne Kinsella. And Anne, as some of you will know, is a key member of staff in Chagas. She's a senior research officer with Chagas, and she specializes in many areas of production, economics, and farm level agricultural economics. And I'm delighted that Anne is also part of our ruralization project in um, the Horizon 2020 project. So I'm delighted to have Anne come and talk to us about some of the work that she has already carried out in the ruralization project. Okay, thank you, Maura, and good afternoon to you all, and thank you for joining us at this webinar event. Um, today, I'm going to take you through some of the patterns emerging from national and European farm data analysis that I undertook as part of the ruralization project, and some additional more recent analysis that I undertook for today's presentation, so, so as to have results as up to date as, as possible. So firstly, I'm going to take you through today's presentation and I'm going to begin with um, an, an overview of, of the presentation, looking at the Irish uh, context and um, looking at the 2019 results and emerging trends in um, farm demographics. Then I will move on to look at the EU context with reference to research undertaken for the ruralization project, looking at the farm accountancy data network and other data sources. And I will focus on the age profile, looking at new entrants and successors in farming, and finally conclude with some discussion points. So firstly, we look at the latest uh, data from Ireland um, for 2019, and we focus on the Irish perspective. 
And from the Irish perspective, the latest data from, for the year 2019 is taken from the Chagas National Farm Survey. And just to provide you with um, some context, the National Farm Survey is operated as part of the Farm Accountancy Data Network uh, of the EU, fulfilling Ireland's statutory obligation in the provision of data on farm output costs and income to the European Commission. And it represents over 92,500 farms nationally. So in moving on to look at some of these results, um, firstly, focusing on age of the farm holder, the average age across um, all systems is uh, just 58 um, years in average. Three of the systems, cattle rearing, cattle other and sheep have an average age, age of 60 years, while dairy system farms are the youngest at 54 years of age. But we quite often hear about the ageing profile of farmers, so I thought we might take a look at how the average age of farmers has changed over the last decade from 2009 to 2019. 2009 is shown in pink and 2019 there in blue. So we can see what a difference a decade makes with regard to the farm holders age. In 2009, the average age of farmers across all farming systems was 55 years of age. And if we move back a decade further and look at the year 1999, how does the average age then compare to the latest data available? And this is shown in green. So there is a three year average increase in age across each of the decades with the age increasing from 52 years of age to 55 years in 2009 and a further three year increase in the next decade to 58 years in 2009. So now we're going to have a look at how demographically viable um, the Irish farms are looking at the percentage of the household that are demographically viable. And in the National Farm Survey, demographically viable is defined as the percentage of farms households where at least one member of the household is under 45 years of age. So if we focus on the current year at 2019, which is shown there in the, the blue bars in the chart, we know that the dairy system is the most demographically viable with 77% of households in this system having at least one member um, under 45 years of age, while the sheep system uh, are the least demographically viable with only half of households having one member under 45 years of age. So if we take a look at 2009 and 1999 years, as we did with the average age, that we, we see that over the decade that the percentage of farm ho households in this category is decreasing over time, reflecting uh, the aging farm households. And across all systems, the percentage decreased from 81% in 1999 to 57% in 2019. So there's about a 1% decline year on year in the percentage in the household that are defined as demographically viable. So if we move on now and take a look at the total um, family labour units and across all farm systems, looking at the average family labour unit, it's just over one labour unit um, at 1.03. And just 10% of the total uh, labour units are female, which are shown there as the purple uh, on the graph. The highest proportion of uh, female labour units are on the dairy system, uh, but just uh, these just equate to 13% of the total family labour units. And for information purposes, the total labour units for both male and female are shown in grey on, on the graph. So if we move now away from the labour input analysis and continue on to take a look at the gender composition by farming system in 2019, firstly looking at female only and male only percentage of farms. The female only are shown there in orange and they're merely 1% on average um, are female only farms with 2% of cattle rearing and uh, tillage farmers being female only. However, if we move and look at farms with a combination of both male and female, which is shown at the gray uh, bar on, on the graph, uh, then the situation is thankfully a lot more promising. 
across all farming systems, uh, the male-female combination occurs on 36% of farms. And the combination is highest on the dairy system, where half of farms, um, there's a combination of male and female. And this is reflective of the partnership arrangements and other arrangements that occur in dairy farms. Um, so, so that's um, something, something promising. Uh, so Irish farms. How do they compare in the EU context or how different are Irish farms? If we look at Ireland in the context of the EU, um, in looking at EU farms, I am referring to analysis which I uh, was undertaken for the ruralization project um, deliverable on um, analysis on rural newcomers, new entrants into farming and successors in farming. And I acknowledge my co-authors on this report our Hungarian and Italian project partners as detailed on the slide. And for the purposes of this presentation, I will focus solely on analysis of EU FADN data that I, I undertook. And it should be noted that in the EU uh, FADN data set, data of a non-financial nature and farm demographic household data are secondary in, in, in their collection. And therefore, as demographic data um, contained in the data set is not contained in the data set to the extent that it was required for the in-depth analysis, hence there was a requirement for some additional methodologies to be applied to some indicative data to determine trends. So in um, order to analyze age trends in the EU FADN, I was required to submit a special request to uh, FADN as I already alluded to, and uh, as there is no access to, to age and demographic variables on the standard um, database result. So in order to carry out the analysis, three age groupings were selected, um, less than 35 years, less than 65 years, and greater than 65 years of age. And that these three age groupings were selected at uh, the less than 35 years to take account of the younger farmers and maybe recent successors or, or new entrants into to, uh, agriculture, the less than 65 years of age um, as they were just below the retirement um, threshold age for self-employed business people in, in general and who make up the, the largest proportion of the farming population within the EU. And finally, a greater than 65 years of age were selected as they are at the, the stage in their life where maybe they're considering retirement or are contemplating stepping back from the, the, the farm uh, bi business. And um, this age selection was, was based on um, weighted average age of holder and managers and uh, so that they can contain one or two or indeed up to four individuals in the farm. So that using this approach gives a good indication of the overall age of all um, owners and managers on the farm. And this methodology was employed to determine the, the farm youth demographic vi viability, which was utilized within this report. So um, employing this methodology, where are the oldest farm cohorts within the EU? Uh, firstly, we'll take a look at the um, earliest years looked at for this particular analysis, which is the 2018 year. Um, and the older farmer cohorts were more evident in the UK, Ireland and Sweden, uh, where the percentage was 12, 16 and 17 percent respectively of the, the farming population. And in order to track if farms have become more viable from an age perspective, the analysis then focused on the most recent year for which data was available. And that was the 2017 year within the, the Fadden database. And collating uh, comparable data in the intervening survey data years and applying the same methodology, trends of an aging farm population are indeed uh, noted across, across the EU. Unfortunately, for the 2017 year data, um, there was a number of, of countries on which um, the calculation was not possible as the statistics were unavailable or there wasn't enough of, of farms in the sample in order to carry out the analysis. And this applies to Ireland, among other countries. So Ireland um, appears there in the 20, 2008 year, but is not in the 2017 year owing to the lack of um, sufficient uh, data in order to do that analysis. So by 17, the situation and ratio indeed had worsened for the farms that we have um, um, to compare within this particular um, um, result. So um, if we look then at the age trends for the, the younger farmer cohorts, these are the farms within the um, 
the Fadden database that are seen to be younger on average and the farms appearing in, in this are Slovenia, Poland and Lithuania, where um, 93, 86 and 80 percent respectively of the farmers are, are younger on average. Um, this is the converse situation and uh, however the proportion of farms less than 35 years are also uh, reducing over the intervening years. So if we look now at the mean age trends across all EU regions, um, and the NUTS2 region, and we compare the 2008 year with the 2017 year, and if we rank all farms from the youngest to the oldest for both years across all regions, we can see an upward trend in the mean age so that farmers are indeed aging across the EU with the latest um, year there um, shown, shown on, the on the top, the blue um, 2017 um, mean age. So the mean age in 2008 was 51 years of age, while by 17, this had increased to uh, 53 years of age. And so to conclude, as the analysis has highlighted, the aging of, of farm managers is a crucial, crucial issue on family farms. And this is not only in Ireland, but right across the EU, within the EU countries and across regions. Almost one third of farm managers across all EU member states are aged 65 years or over. And only 11% of farm managers in the EU were younger than 40 years of age. Um, in contrast um, to this, only 11% um, were 40 years, and in contrast, one third, that's 32%, were 65 years of age or older. And if we look at Ireland, in comparison to this, in Ireland, 13% were less than 40 years of age, while the vast majority were in the older age categories. So um, our, our data... Um, does refer to the, the fact that in general, um, farm managers and farm households are aging, not only in Ireland, but across the EU. So thank you for your attention. And I now hand you back to Maura. Thanks, Anne. Um, just, we're, we're going to play a short little video clip shortly um, via rural, that has been um, created via the Ruralisation Project. It's a nice animation video. But just before we started, James, we might, we just have a couple of short little questions that have come in um, from a few people. I think we might actually deal with them now before we move on to the next group of speakers. And um, Kevin, thank you very much for your question in and around uh, a, a, a hint of an alternative intervention logic via the Court of Auditors regenerate, regenerational renewal uh, emerging from the ruralization project. And I suppose it is a little bit early at this stage, Kevin, to maybe see that um, uh, we would be creating any kind of an alternative intervention logic. However, I do see that because we will be dealing quite extensively with generational renewal and maybe combined with a lot of the work that's going on in the newbie project, which will be presented by John Moriarty shortly, um, I suppose those projects really will feed into some kind of a new or alternative intervention logic. Um, just another question here from Sean. Um, Sean, I, I suppose you, you were asking the question, how do you feel about rural areas benefiting or did rural areas benefit from the CEDRA report? Um, I think any report here in Ireland that is commissioned and that carries out the extent of work that the CEDRA Commission did and the CEDRA report did, I think has to have uh, benefited hugely. And I think um, any piece of work or any um, consultation process that involves a huge amount of people right across the country and puts rural issues and rural areas on a policy agenda definitely has had an impact. Um, Sean also asked a question in and around community development and do we think community development might be an important pillar of ruralization? Um, absolutely, absolutely. I think everything that we're doing in creating this ruralization, this regeneration kind of thinking for rural areas that will be a place of greater economic and social value definitely is a place that cannot um, survive, it cannot regenerate, it cannot become a ruralization process without this key element of community development. In relation to your presentation, I think if you wanted to answer it now before we go on to the video. Yeah, that's perfect, Maura. Yeah, the, the question there is with regard to the combination of male and female on farms, and does it imply that they have the same status on the farm? Um, that In relation to that question, that is where um, the, the, the farmer um, 
indicates that they, they are either a, a holder, a farm holder or a manager. So it relates um, to anybody that indicates that they work on the farm as a farm holder or a manager. So um, it's self-reported and um, we just feel that maybe there are some females that do not uh, put their name on the farm returns um, when they're asked that question by the farm recorder. So I even feel that with regard to the combination that that is probably also underreported. Thank you, Anne. And again, for anybody else that is listening to us and has tuned in, we're only delighted if you can ask um, some of your questions, put them into the Q&A at the bottom of your screen, and hopefully we'll be able to deal with these, maybe not in full detail, but um, definitely as we go along. And any of the other speakers who also would like to pick up on the questions being asked, I'd be only delighted if you could do that as well. So just before we go on to our next group of speakers, we just have a short little video that was created by the Ruralisation Project, and it will give you another little insight into what ruralisation is all about. The economic, social and territorial cohesion of the EU is threatened by the unequal development of urban and rural areas. Rural areas need to overcome population decline and ageing of rural society on one side and attract new generations able to generate new and innovative opportunities for sustainable development in EU rural areas. Ruralisation aims at triggering a process of rural regeneration by identifying and understanding circumstances and drivers that make some rural areas to grow and perform better than others. Once identified, those good practices can be translated into concrete policies and tools to apply in declining rural areas. The project focuses on rural newcomers, new entrants into farming and access to land as key elements of rural regeneration. By applying a multi-actor approach, ruralisation addresses and involves farmers, local authorities, local action groups, rural youth and other civil society organisations from rural areas. All those actors will be involved in more than 30 case studies and over 100 regional stakeholders meetings on good practices or innovations that revitalise a wide range of rural areas, well portraying the diversity of rural contexts across Europe. Good practices also highlight stories of rural young heroes, young women and men who relocated to the countryside to accomplish their dream and have brought new life to rural territories. With a multidisciplinary and diverse consortium of 18 partners from 12 European countries, ruralisation will shed new light on the understanding of rural development and contribute to achieving a more populated, diverse and sustainable rural society in Europe. Thanks to James for playing that short video for us that we have constructed via the Ruralisation Project. So just to move on to our next speaker, our next speaker is Shane Conway. And Shane is our um, postdoctoral researcher in relation to our National Rural Network Project. Shane uh, works alongside me in NUI Galway, and he has done a tremendous amount of work in relation to generational renewal and some of his work has been widely acclaimed and widely uh, published. So we're delighted to have Shane to talk to us today in relation to this idea of future farmers and access to land and the farming sector. Thank you, Shane. Thanks a million, Maura. I'll just get my screen up here now. Okay, um, thanks very much for having me. I'm gonna speak about, um, well, it's my research since 2013, but also um, how it has developed over the past few years and how the policy has, developed in line with that. So that's the title there. Um, as Maura introduced me, I work in the Rural Studies Unit at NUI Galway in the Discipline of Geography, and also I'm working on the National Rural Network Project. So um, Maura and Anne have actually set the scene very well for me. Um, I don't need to go in too much into the demographics of uh, the farming community, but you know the, the demographic trends do reveal, as, as Anne pointed out, that one third of farmers are above the normal retirement age of 65, uh, the societal normal. Um, only 5.6% are, are run by farmers under 35. And uh, just a novel um, statistic that um, it is estimated that for every young farmer, there are nine older farmers. So the age structure, again, this is um, 
kind of just a visual way to portray that data. Um, I suppose what you need to look at here is the blue. Uh, these are uh, less than 35 years of age farmers across Europe. So, and the darker color towards the top and the orange uh, over 65. So you can see there is an imbalance. Um, and then we lead, this leads us on to generation renewal. And it's predominantly because of this aging population also to uh, retain the traditional family farm model, which uh, relates to the culture of European farming, even worldwide and the broad sustainability of rural communities. So in Ireland particularly, we need uh, farming to, for rural society more generally because it's such a pivotal um, part of it. And, and as we mentioned, CAP is a, one of the key objectives of um, the next cap, sorry. So intergenerational farm transfer, which is probably the, the most, um, the, the theme of the presentation, it's, it's a natural progression from the aging farm population, the, the transfer of the farm to the next generation. Um, and of course, this has got to do with food production in the future as well, who's going to produce our food. Um, so leading on to that, uh, it's referred to as we've heard land mobility and access to land. Um, they're for, kind of use the same term. Um, it's the single largest barrier for young people attempting to enter the uh, agricultural sector. And a report published when I started my PhD back in 2013, um, the lack of land mobility is stifling growth and preventing young farmers for, from uh, gaining access to reductive assets. And reductive assets in this context is land. However, and this is very important, you know, there's, I suppose, so far, we've been hearing about the aging farming population and their stifling growth and pretty much they're in the way, I suppose. That's a lot of the language that's been used uh, throughout the past few years. Um, but we need to really take into account that, OK, there's a reluctance to set aside and there's a reluctance to retire. And this is despite a, lo a, lo a range of financial enticements. But the human side of this whole process has been look overlooked and it's only in more in the past, maybe even three years, that there's been sort of um, attention towards this, that, that there's a deeper connection to this, that farmers are reluctant to step aside for a range of measures. And this range from their identity to their status to their, uh, the, I suppose, the, the way they're perceived in society as well, that there's a cultural expectation that farmers don't retire and those who do retire seem to be giving up or must have no option to do so, but to ill health. Um, farmers want to uh, remain active and productive in later life. So that's a, a real key point that needs to be considered that although there's an aging farming population, these farmers, you know, even to extend it into the farmer farm relationship, um, that there's, there's a legitimate connectedness to be by being uh, farming. They're rooted in place in the sense that they've, they've grown up there and that they've really connected to the even towards say the sheds on the farm, they can relate different milestones, I suppose. The farm acts as kind of a mosaic of their achievements over the years and a sense of nostalgia in that the, they could have inherited from their family, for example. Or, so I suppose a lot of the time these issues are called the soft issues and the challenge of transition is overwhelming for a lot of them and policy should be more concerned with the welfare of older farmers and depth their needs. And this is where the, the soft issues, the, the social and emotional issues are, are, are talked about. But these are really are the hard issues because you can't fit these into an economic model and say, this is what we should do or policy can't just come in with a very direct economic enticement and go here, here, take this and retire or pass it on. So, you know, when we look at all this, a more age diverse farming population is imperative, not just the younger generation, but age diversity. So that's what the key. So an emerging narrative, and there has been emerging narratives, be it the previous uh, Minister of Agriculture, uh, Mokrana Pharma even uh, suggested a move away from retirement to uh, succession, and this will create a more positive view, which is which is really encouraging to see. And we need to look no further than the collaborative farming arrangements as well, which which will be talked about later, um, be it uh, farm partnerships, for example. And these have been actively promoted within Irish and European um, policy discourses as ideal stepping stones. But it's also important to, uh, again, going back to the economic models and the fact that financial enticements won't always work, that whilst farm partnerships, you know, they will tick all the boxes, you know, when you, when you look at this, how it should work. But there's also 
power dynamics involved at a, at a farm level that also need to be taken into account. So when we're looking at this, some of my research um, looked at this uh, kind of in depth over the past few years and uncover uncovering these obstacles. So there's managerial dynamics at play, as I said, the older generation are reluctant and indeed resistance to alter the status quo of the farm and uh, changes from say one farming system to the next. Um, that's an example, but you know, this is a strong feature of farming. Um, and there's these asymmetric hierarchical relations within farm households that, you know, they are being sustained, even though there are partnerships in a lot of cases signed over, there's the, the older generation have certain defense mechanisms and tactics almost that are delivered through everyday communication. Um, so for example, reiterating their indispensability and that they are key towards the future of the farm. Doesn't matter what age they are, they're key, which is which is the case, but this is kind of what's happening, imposing their mindset that one system of farming is better than another. Unilateral acts of generosity. So here's 10 heifers for this year that will keep you happy kind of language, you know, and reasserting one's authority. So I suppose this, this is just one of the quotes that uh, I, I'm um, kind of extracting from my research, but this kind of tells the story quite well of what I'm trying to explain. So this is a 71 year old mixed livestock farmer. So even though most of the farm is signed over to my son, in my head, it's still mine, you know, while I'm fit and able to do a bit, um, I stay in charge of the signed over, but I stay in charge of the account. Um, I do the borrow work, you see, I sign the checkbooks and that kind of stuff. It makes sense, though, I've been doing it a hell of a lot longer. But this is a farmer who's 71 who has signed it over, but yet the management, as in the decision-making power, still remains. So in a lot of cases, uh, this probably tells the story quite well, and in a sense, and, and, and granted, this paper was actually written in 1996, so quite a while ago, and Prince Charles still finds himself in the same situation in that, you know, they're at that stage of their life, but yet they're not the boss or making the decision. So, unfortunately, a lot of farmers um, are finding themselves in that situation. And even with the partnerships, as we've seen, this is more of a recent phenomenon, they could still find themselves not making those decisions. And in a lot of cases, younger generation aren't going to accept that the way they did previously. They go on a professional detour as it's re as referred to, but will they come back to the land? And, that, and that's an issue. So that's why this decision-making, um, younger farmers are looking for more independence, responsibility, and it, generation renewal as a policy objective is much more than reducing the average age of farming. It's about empowering younger farmers to, um, uptake of technology. There's a lot more sustainable farming practices needed. Um, the modern farm is a very dynamic uh, working place. Um, so the older generation, for all this to be made possible, need to bring the younger generation to the decision making, not just helping out or not just, you know, kind of, it, it's, it's that they need to make changes in a sense and the old generation needs to be more, you know, willing for this to happen. Uh, otherwise, the younger generation might just get tired of that or even the anticipation of not having managerial decisions uh, may, may be an issue. So the, the fact of the matter is that ultimately the old generation decide whether transfer or managerial decisions are made or transferred or not. So the most sophisticated farm transfer land mobility schemes are, are of little avail if uh, policy is not prepared to understand the language of farming and how hard it is for the old generation to let go. Uh, the language of farming and that, that the way it works on the ground. So um, through my research and more recently other research, there's a, a move towards more farmer sensitive policy design and implementation. And you know a cultural shift is needed uh, for this for this age renewal generation renewal to occur. And this this requires well informed and intelligent policy interventions. So the challenge is that it's twofold. So we need to look at how this power in that their experience can be exercised legitimately for the good at hand. So the intergenerational aspect of it, that the older generation can maintain um, some sort of activity on the farm, but yet remain cognizant that this, this can kind of overpower the, older gen the younger generation, excuse me, and that there's an inappropriate um, domination of the younger generation and there's the sustainable change needed may not occur. So. Uh, you know, we really need to be careful with this because not every 
farm is the same not every farmer is the same um does it so it's there's there's everyone is unique i suppose so it, it's it needs to be handled professionally in that sense and one of our suggestions and i was lucky enough to avail of this training and i, I participated in it when i was spent time in the us because this is a, a global phenomenon that this issue and um, that the a best practice model uh, is essential when we're looking at facilitation or coordination of farm succession um, when you're looking at the younger and older generations visions objectives goals for the future of the farm so this is the IFTN, their, their co-bases in Iowa, and they run a training program. Um, and people have from Ireland have obtained this training as well. So, you know, that this is this knowledge base is out there. And, and as I said, this is a global phenomenon. So using a, a global model for this um, to try and facilitate this farm transfer or managerial decisions from one generation to the next it is an important one. And the IFTN uh, have picked up on the Irish research and they value this perspective that the older generations, it's this way of life is important to them. And later it's, it's, we can't forget about that, that generation renewal is great, but it should be more so even intergeneration renewal. So I, I'll go through it quickly. You can look this up yourselves if, you, if you're more interested, but their role is not to come up with instant solutions, these succession facilitators or coordinators. They, they guide the farm, farm uh, members through the process in an unbiased manner. They follow a three-step blueprint where the farm is now, where do you want it to be, and how do you get there? And um, it's kind of a clever way they, they try and make it take a place outside the family home because in every farm household, you suppose you have the kitchen table and there's a hierarchy on the table, the father, the mother sit in a certain area. So if it's in a neutral environment, everyone has to negotiate their position and there's not that same comfort to, to kind of voice um, maybe inappropriate domination again. So external um, intergenerational communication is key. Um, the facilitator brings all family members together, even those who may not be interested in farming in the future, um, and cover, uncover everyone's perspectives and views. And of course, perspectives and views will change over time, um, but the, the facilitator then will direct them in certain ways either to a solicitor or, you know, the facilitator kind of finds out the status quo and then uh, guides them in whatever direction is needed. Of course, navigate through difficult conversations, clarify expectations, avoid assumptions, and tension inevitably may arise um, if there's disparities, but the facilitator ensures that the tough questions are asked and the what-if scenarios. So there's quite a few what-if scenarios, but this, again, they're not coming up with solutions, they're just trashing out these ideas. And coming towards a shared understanding is a, will hopefully make better dis, um, decisions in, the, in a collective manner. And, but I suppose this is all well and good, and this is all very, very kind of uh, idealistic in a sense. Um, and we've looked at kind of different ways of making this kind of more, more realistic, not even more realistic, but more po po the increasing the possibility. Um, there needs to be a seed that stimulates the need to act. So perhaps farm transfer process uh, policy should insist of, on a course of facilitation sessions, ideally funded by the Department of Agriculture, in order to be eligible for farm partnerships, for example. In a lot of cases, you know, farm partnerships may be signed um, without the family ever having the chat of, of what happens next, or can I make decisions, or the change in, in, in the power dynamics. So even, even furthermore, that maybe if it's extended beyond those, uh, beyond um, farm transfer to even towards a, a, for young farmers training as an agricultural degree, that um, perhaps they, uh, they, they, they have to kind of get involved in this chat as part of a module. And that means that this conversation is brought up a lot earlier than the farm transfer is going to happen. So that means it kind of removes the taboo topic and makes it a bit more normalized that, well, I have to do this session to, to qualify as a, as a young trained farmer. And this would open these lines of communication from an earlier stage, as I mentioned, uh, whether they're in the process of uh, farm transfer or not. So just a quick note on this, that I, I do acknowledge that the, the usefulness of mediation and farm transfer is outlined in Chagas's guide to transferring the family farm. But again, when we're talking about farmer sensitive language and under, you know, mediation is generally seen as, a, as an intervention for a dispute, i.e. marriage separation or divorce even, but facilitation is preliminarily used 
pre-conflict, that it's it's more of a, a positive process. So we, we would suggest the term uh, facilitation or firm succession facilitation or coordination is instead. So, you know, in recognition that the farming population is diverse, there's no one the same, the ideas presented here should not be a one size fixed all model for fixing this problem or situation. But, and this is an important point, I suppose, to wrap it up, addressing the human side of this process is essential moving forward. That this is not just about economics. This is not just about financial enticements. There's a lot more, even it's, it's even the ideal succession models, farm transfer, uh, land mobility models, these all need to take into account this human side, be it the power dynamics, be it the loss of identity and status in later life. And um, that's that's something to sign off on. So thanks for your attention. I suppose John B. Kane had a good grasp of all this back in 1965, and I think it's as relevant now as it was then. So um, yeah, thank you. Jane, thanks a million. Um, yeah, there's such a broad and uh, depth of, of issues in and around your research chain, and they really hit in on all our issues that we have in ruralization, this idea of access to land and this idea of our future farmers, but also our need to consider the farmers that are there at the moment, the older farmer, and the need to consider them. Shane, there's a few questions there, but what I might do is I might let Ashling start her presentation and maybe give you a chance to have a look at some of the questions, and then maybe we might go back to them towards the end of the presentations, if that's okay with you. It'll just give you a chance to have a look. So um, the next person on our list of Ashling is, is there in the background. Um, Ashling is going to present on some of the work as well that we've carried on in the ruralization project and looking at innovative land practices in uh, European at European level. And Ashling is the postdoctoral researcher on the ruralization project for us in Inuit Galway. And uh, to date, um, Ashling has carried out a number of um, pieces of work. Uh, from the conceptual framework to the assessment uh, framework for the ruralization project. So again, as a key member of the ruralization team, and I suppose we're not just delighted to have her, we're absolutely blessed to have her on this project. So Ashling is going to look again at this idea of the innovative land practices at a European level, which was part of the project, um, for, part of one of the work packages of the project. So Ashling, I'll hand over to you. Uh, thanks a million, Maura. Um, you can see the, the slides okay there, it's slight, um, slightly slow to get them up, but I think we're yeah. there. No, um, they're all there. Right. <laughs> okay. Um, so uh, today I kind of, I just want to touch on some of the ongoing work um, that um, we're focused on in ruralization. Um, and this is a piece of work that is led by our French partner, uh, Terre de Lienne, um, and we had the opportunity to work closely um, with Terre de Lien on, on this particular um, piece of work in terms of uh, feeding in some of the, some of the kind of concepts and, and thinking that we developed uh, underpinning the project. Um, but as I said, it's a kind of an ongoing piece of work that um, probably will raise more questions than, than answers. Um, but, um, what I'll do today is basically run through some of these innovative land practices that have been identified in this first phase of, of this um, particular piece of research that we're working on for ruralization. Um, and, and I guess the question that's underpinning this and underpinning ruralization overall is, is finding more kind of effective ways um, that are targeted to, to new entrants. Um, to how to support new entrants into farming. So it kind of, I guess, new entrants are a difficult group to define, but the way I kind of come at it today is maybe the new entrant who doesn't have a farming background is, is a crossover between the, the successor and the new entrant. But um, the practices that, that we'll, I'll talk about are more targeted the the new entrant who doesn't have um, the family farming background. Um, and just to say very briefly kind of why, why this is important, I suppose, from a research perspective and um, that I suppose current research is very much saying that there is a need for kind of novel practices or novel policy tools that support um, these kind of new entrants into farming. 
who are a very diverse group that um, the graphic there on the right hand side helps to illustrate um, that new entrants can be uh, someone who is a part-time farmer, someone who perhaps is uh, in a remote rural area or working off a very small parcel of land that's close to an urban area. Um, so we have different types of new entrants in different types of rural areas and different, I suppose, European realities <clears throat> from, from Ireland to, um, to France um, to Finland. So we have a very complex space here that we're, we're trying to identify uh, new policy tools and uh, to address um, this quite diverse group um, of farmers. So it's just, it is a significant um, challenge for policy. And as Shane uh, talked about already, there is this no one size fits all or perhaps no kind of few models that we can draw on. So what we're, we're doing in realization is looking quite deeply at a lot of different projects and practices that can potentially um, provide new tools um, for policy. So in terms of where we are within realization at the moment, and um, this is, a, I suppose, a three phase um, piece of research. Uh, and at the moment, we have just finished phase one, which is kind of a scoping exercise across Europe. Um, looking at these innovative land practices um, from kind of, I suppose, a range of different types of organisations, public, private, uh, and I suppose community civil society, um, that are offering kind of new approaches to facilitate new entrants. Um, and the next phases are very much about more um, in-depth, detailed study of a small select sample of, of these innovative practices. Um, and I think quite importantly is kind of the final phase that we're not just identifying good practice, but we're exploring how it can work in new contexts, how it might be upscaled. So that's kind of the final phase of this research. So at the moment, we're very much at the start, having identified a range of, of practices um, that are this kind of this, this, we have this idea of promising underpinning realization project that are promising to support new entrants. Um, and as I said, this is a piece of work that's very much led, led by Terre de Lienne, um, one of the realization partners in France. But it's, a, a, I guess, reflective of realization that is, has this kind of multi-actor, it's a multi-actor project of universities to NGOs, um, lots of different kinds of organizations involved. So we have this report and that will um, be published early next year. And that's um, where I'll draw the information um, from for, for today's presentation. But um, this report will be available um, early next year. Um, and just for a couple of quick minutes to talk about um, kind of I suppose questions of definition and drawing boundaries around what we're talking about here. Um, so, so when we talk about access to land, it's it's a very complex, I suppose, uh, question. Um, and in ruralization, we try to deal with with that complexity and how we approach um, and look at access to land. So, the idea is that it's not something that is, I suppose, a one time. Uh, gaining access, maybe um, leasing land, um, but it's also about the control. So if you think about a short term lease versus a very a long term, maybe five, 10 year lease, which gives much more control to a new entrant um, uh, entering farming. But it's also about, I suppose, maintenance of that control, which um, leads into issues around fa farm viability. And um, so I guess we're, we're looking at access to land as quite a, a complex idea that um, is something that, that changes over time and is impacted by factors um, outside the farm as well, by market factors. Um, so for this piece of research that is phase one of this uh, exploration into access to land, um, these practices have been categorised kind of along this pathway that, that taps into some of this idea of how complex um, 
the question of access to land is that it's that it's something that even happens before um, a new entrant perhaps enters the farming profession um, to something that continues to happen um, once uh, the person is established in farming. Um, and when I talk about the innovative land practices, again, these are quite varied practices that can operate at one or a number of points of, of this pathway. Um, so there are, say, practices that support entry into farming, such as farm incubators, um, uh, practices that support um, recultivation of abandoned land, to practices that help connect um, retiring farmers and new entrants. So there's a huge range of practices here that potentially uh, support new entrants that we have looked at as part of this first phase. Um, so the, the idea is that as well, that they're kind of dealing with more than one issue, that they're integrated, that they perhaps deal with the access to land problem, and uh, the, the, the issue around land prices, um, and also wider issues such as developing farmers' skills to, to support um, their professional development in farming. And also these, these practices that are often linked to kind of other goals. So they'll support maybe uh, environmental issues around rural regeneration, depending on their starting point, generational renewal. Um, so they're often tied to, to wider, wider goals as well. So just to kind of situate the practices in some way. So for the next couple of minutes, I just wanted to talk about some of the examples that came up in this uh, scoping exercise in this first phase. And one quite interesting example is this idea of farm incubators that is somewhat similar to the idea of um, business incubators. So if you have a startup enterprise, um, they're supported through through perhaps training and funding. The same kind of idea applies to these uh, farm incubators that they provide a kind of test space for someone who maybe has no farming background um, and needs to develop the farming skills and also the business kind of management skills that they also perhaps as a small group of, of, of new entrants who are working um, as part of a farm incubator who get to connect um, and, and learn from each other as well. And they're uh, given access to land, be it for a short period or a longer period, for perhaps six months to a year. There's a lot of examples uh, on, on the slide there that will operate differently in terms of farm incubators. Um, and it may be um, the access to land and the training um, and the incubation period is longer or shorter, depending on um, the practice. Um, and the idea with, I suppose, the farm incubator that is that new entrants get to develop and test their skills um, in the real world context and explore, I suppose, the farming profession as well as whether it's, it's something that they want to enter into in the long term. And also, if they're a new entrant, perhaps, perhaps they don't have the family background um, or there can be broader cultural connections, a network of, of farming peers. So it's, it's an attractive model that I suppose emerged and that is um, we, we see examples um, across uh, different European countries. Um, the next example that's interesting is um, um, I suppose practices that help to connect um, land people who own land and people who who want to use that land for farming. Um, I suppose we have the we have the land mobility scheme in Ireland that very much it works on this goal. But we just wanted to highlight a couple of the the practices that I suppose do this slightly differently and show that um, different types of organisations can become involved in. Um, connecting land and new entrants. So this red terrain is a Spanish example of a network um, that supports local authorities to kind of mobilize uh, land that's currently not, not in use um, for farming. So this organization would provide the kind of uh, the, the management structures to help get that land 
um, and make it available um, for farming. And it also supports as with private landowners as well to do the same thing. Um, provides things like uh, a contract agreement that helps to formalize the relationship. Um, and I suppose in the, the case of, of this example, it's often small land parcels, maybe more marginal land, which is the reason for its abandonment. Um, and projects tend to be maybe social farming or small scale projects. Um, but again, it, it helps to illustrate uh, the different types of actors, local authorities, or maybe in the Irish context, um, a group that we don't maybe necessarily associate with becoming involved in the space of supporting new entrants into farming. Another one that's interesting here is a German example. Um, a contact forum, Hoffer Gabe, and excuse my pronunciation, um, but basically this is a two-day event that helps um, to connect um, so, um, new entrants and um, and uh, retiring organic farmers. So very much kind of about networking, workshops, getting people together um, to explore um, the whole uh, potential new entrant uh, taking over the farm. Um, so it just kind of adds a kind of more, I suppose, a social aspect to how we might connect um, current landholders uh, and those new entrants who are, who are seeking land. Um, another interest, interesting example, again, is our organizations that work on an, land acquisition. Um, and there's a number of examples um, that were documented um, within this first phase of the research. Um, the examples there, Terre de Lien, who I mentioned already, Culture Land, a uh, German example, and the Ecological Land Cooperative. And these organizations acquire land um, and they often have environmental motivations. So if, if they are renting land to farmers, there may be specific uh, criteria on the leases that um, environmental or agroecological farming practices um, and must be carried out on the land. And these kind of organizations that work in this space work at very different scales in Europe. You see the example of Terre de Lien um, compared to the Ecological Land Cooperative in the UK. And um, so there are different, um, different levels um, of land acquisition organization, which kind of shows the, I suppose, the adaptability of the model. Um, so that kind of just gives a flavor of um, some of the practices that we investigated as part of this phase one, um, looking at potentially innovative and promising new tools to support new entrants. And just for the last couple of minutes, I just wanted to kind of draw out something that, you know, at this stage, at this early stage, what are kind of some of the key um, findings that, that we found ourselves um, uh, moving towards. I suppose one of the key things was in when you're talking about these kinds of projects, that human and social capital were kind of a key driver. And now this isn't to discount or um, to raise human and social and capital above something like financial capital, which is absolutely crucial, but, but that we do need kind of different types of resources to, um, to facilitate these, these types of practices. The key role of partnerships between different types of organizations, and also a key role for public actors to kind of provide potentially funding, um, and also a focus on governance um, within the organizations, how, if it is a partnership, how they can effectively work together. And this question of bottom up um, and sharing of knowledge. And if you have multi-partner approach, you have lots of different kinds of knowledge, lots of kind of um, complementary um, perspectives that come together to, to give strength. Um, to these, these types of practices. And what I haven't mentioned um, in terms of um, what I talk about, what I talked about today was the Irish uh, practices that we documented as part of this first phase. And two were, I suppose, EIP Agri projects, um, one in Donegal and one in Wicklow. Um, and again, when you think about some of the key findings, I suppose, that emerged from this first phase, EIP, EIP Agri kind of ticks a lot of these boxes the, that it's um, partnerships between different types of organizations 
um, that it's bottom up, that it's it's tailored. So I guess um, in terms of policy tools that might facilitate um, these kinds of new approaches, EIP Agri, again, um, looks like a potentially promising wider um, policy approach. So that's kind of all really I wanted to say that this report um, will be published early next year. Sign up for our newsletter, stay updated. There are some materials currently available um, on the EIP Agri database. There's a selection of uh, these practices documented um, through short summaries. And also the Access to Land Network have really great publications. They have been working to, to analyze and uh, document these types of practices over the last number of years. So two publications there um, very much um, worth a look to, to explore these types of practices that I just talked about and lots of others. Um, and as well to flag up a couple of other reports emerging on access to land that ruralization um, has been working on that will be out early next year and um, that take a slightly different perspective, looking at law and policy at, at the member state level that supports access to land and also a report looking at a land market trends um, led by uh, TU Delft, um, our partner in, in the Netherlands. So that's it. Thank you. I think I've <laughs> said enough. Sorry, gone over time. Thanks. A, thanks a lot, Ashling. No, no, no. It was very, very informative. And I think what we've learned so far, which is really important out of our work on the ruralization project, is this real need for these novel practices, I suppose, that support new entrants to farming and our access to land. So some of the work that we've carried out really shows us how important this is. Um, we have some, again, some really interesting questions coming in via the Q&A and please keep them coming. And what we will do is as we finish all of the presentations, all of the cameras of the panelists will go on and we'll be able to put a lot of the questions to the panelists at that stage. So I think we're going to move on now to our, our third speaker in this session, um, Teresa Hooks. And Teresa is coming from uh, our National Rural Network element. And Teresa is a Research and Development Officer in the National Rural Network. And Teresa carried out some excellent work going back a couple of years ago on uh, producer uh, organizations. And it really fits in very, very well in relation to the work that ruralization is doing at the moment and how we can gain access to land, how we can create, I suppose, new novel practices for young people entering farming and for access to land. So I'm going to hand it over to Teresa to um, tell you a little bit more about her, um, the potential of uh, producer organizations. Okay, so good afternoon, everyone. Uh, as Maura said, my name is Teresa Hooks, and I'm the Research Development Officer with the National Rural Network. Um, but previous to this, I conducted PhD research uh, with Chagas through the Walsh Fellowship Programme and UCC to look at the potential of producer organisations, particularly within the Irish beef sector. Uh, but today I'm going to try and give you a brief overview of producer organisations and how they can help farmers to integrate the supply chain to address viability issues. But that's obviously a key issue for today's farmers and for our future farmers in attracting them into the industry as such. So first and foremost, just to give you a brief overview of what I'm going to speak about today before a short introduction, I'm going to look at some supply chain definitions uh, and then to give you an overview of POs, so what they are about, and then look at them across the EU and Ireland and outline some barriers to PO development here in Ireland and then draw up some conclusions. So first and foremost, we know that the family farm model is the predominant model of agriculture across the EU and in Ireland, and they're central to a lot of our policy goals. So in terms of economic goals, in terms of increasing our agricultural output and feeding the global growing population, uh, addressing social goals such as enhancing rural sustainability and retaining rural population densities, but also environmental goals in terms of managing our land and providing ecosystem services. But we also know that a lot of the family farms can be economically unviable or they rely on off-farm income for subsidies to survive. And that's often true in the commodity markets where they lack the required economies of scale to compete. So when we talk about the supply chain, we know that supply chains are becoming more globalized and more complex. And that draws up a whole lot of issues in terms of inequalities. And they usually tend to further the lower end of the chain, the higher end of the chain, sorry, so in terms of our processors and multiples, and that puts downward pressure then on the margins that are experienced at farm level or producer level. 
if we think about it here in Ireland in terms of supply chain issues, I think the beef supply chain is one that we can all kind of draw quick to memory because there has been a lot of animosity between producers and processors. And we can all quite quickly think back to protests and things like that. And it's often a still ongoing issue. So when we talk about the supply chain and in recent years, we've heard uh, aspects of value chains and values chains. What are the differences between them and where do the producers fit within this? So I just want to give you a brief kind of overview on this here. So when we talk about the supply chain, essentially what we're talking about is commodities. So low cost products that are generally produced in high volumes. And within these chains, the producers are generally seen as just input suppliers. So it's very much so a vendor buyer relationship where the producers within the chain are very much so price takers. When we look at the value chain then, within this, there's a focus on the distribution of power and profits across the chain. So if we think about things like fair trade or aspects like that, that is a value chain. And then when we move on to values chains or values-based supply chains, there's a focus here on the values embodied within food products. So that might be something like uh, sustainability attributes, um, organic foods, non-GMO foods, and then also the relationships across the chain. So for example, for my PhD, uh, I went to the, or to the US to look at a beef co-op that was embedded in a values-based supply chain. So they were producing a natural beef, non-GMO product for that targeted consumer, so supplying that really high-end whole food store for those consumers. So it's very much so a shared values approach within that chain, and that the partners, that well, the input suppliers within these chains are actually partners and not just vendors. And then, of course, then we have short food supply chains, and these aim to re-emphasize the social embeddedness of locally produced food. So to reduce that distance between producer and consumer, that's what we've come to know really within aspects of the farmers' markets and things like that. So when we try and kind of picture a supply chain in our mind, I suppose this is kind of what we look at. So that movement of food from farmer to processor, retailer, and then on to the end consumer. So where do POs fit within this? And how can they help farmers to integrate to the supply chain? So POs are essentially a legally constituted group of farmers or producers. I think the easiest way to think about them is as cooperatives because they are user owned, user controlled and user benefit organizations. In that sense that they allow farmers to cooperate in a formal setting and achieve scale, which brings them to the table to be able to negotiate on price and essentially rebalance their position and that power within the supply chain. And that's what they aim to do. They can take form legally as cooperatives, associations or private companies in which agricultural producers are the main shareholders. And they were essentially set up as cited here by DEFRA to address a market failure, to provide a route to market that didn't exist or to rebalance power within the supply chain. So when we look back to that previous kind of outline of the supply chain, you can see here, this is exactly where the PO fits. So it's that extra step where the farmer uh, supplies into that PO to create that critical mass, to be able to bargain with the next stage par part of the chain and uh, enable contracting here at this point. And that essentially aims to try and move them from that price taker to price maker uh, thing. So as we know, I mentioned that they're so similar to cooperatives there. Cooperatives have been quite a strong feature in our Irish agriculture sector, particularly in the dairy sector. And they've been really, you know, uh, given they've been the reason there's been such stability and growth within the Irish dairy sector. So where did POs come from or how did they come about in the other sectors of uh, the agri-food? So the common market organization is the framework that supplies the support for uh, POs within the common agriculture policy. So the CMO provides that framework for market support schemes. And essentially what it does is that it enables the EU to monitor and manage the markets of agricultural products through POs just to stabilize the food markets. So what it does essentially is it aims to ensure that farmers do not suffer low price returns on goods produced. And then on the flip side, that consumers have good quality food that they can afford. So the CMO for producer organizations were, was first extended to the fruit and vegetable sector in 1996. And still to this day, the fruit and vegetable sector have an operational fund, but they can draw down subsidies to support their incomes for, for complying with regulations. So some of you may think, well, there's producer groups that operate in different sectors of Irish agriculture. So what's the difference between these and POs? Well, the main key difference is that POs are regulated at EU level. So they're regulated through the CMO and then they're implemented at national level through legislation, which is normally called the statutory instrument, as to how they can operate within that member state. So to be recognised as a PO within your member state, you must comply with sector specific rules as set out in the statutory instrument. So, for example, here in Ireland, we have POs operating within the beef sector, within the fruit and vegetable sector and also within seafood sectors. 
So it's not a one size fits all model across the sectors. There's different rules for each sector to which you must uh, comply with. But here I'm just going to outside, outline sorry, some broad rules that kind of apply to all the sectors here uh, in the POs in Ireland. So first and foremost, for PO recognition, it must be set up on the initiative of producers and be led by producers. POs must also have a minimum number of members or they must have a minimum volume or value of product. They must pursue at least one of the objectives set out as per PO sector rules. So say, for example, we're talking about beef POs. Some of the objectives could be collective bargaining, and um, joint purchase of inputs, joint selling of outputs, and aspects like that. So you must uh, set up to address at least one of the objectives set out for, you, for your sector rules. POs must also be registered as a legal entity with the company's registration office. And then they also have to apply to the Department of Agriculture, Food and Marine for recognition, and then report to the department annually on that basis also. So what are the advantages of PO? So I've always also already kind of outlined this enhanced integration to the supply chain and the fair prices that it can lead to by bringing them to the table with that critical mass. But it can also do things like co match coordination supply to match demand. And that's quite critical for POs to be able to do, to give processors and retailers that year round supply. If you think about even in terms of the beef sector, we know in February and October, that's when the highest supplies of cattle come in. So for a PO, they have to be able to coordinate the supply to match with demand. And that's an advantage uh, for processors as well to be able to negotiate and have that supply coming steadily from farmers. Also aspects like knowledge transfer and information sharing between members. We know in recent years that there has been a little bit of a shift from that, just that top-down approach, but also that peer-to-peer -peer, uh, learning through KT groups. And POs have that, can act as a conduit also to do that, even for things like agri-digitization or nutrient management planning, or even conducting their own research. So there is aspects in there that can be covered there too. They also have improved marketing and promotional opportunities, and they also have the ability to coordinate higher quality projects. So that could be things like enhanced grading systems or um, maybe quality assurance schemes or things like that. So giving that higher quality and streamlining that projects of PO offers. There is other examples such as greater chance to add value to projects that's a target higher value added markets. Uh, some research and some of the research I was involved in would say this cooperation within the PO and also tar targeting higher value added markets would get, act as a higher buffer even uh, for viability. And even Bert Dewey would also would say that POs are better in the context of these higher value added markets. And they also have the ability then to address the management of byproducts of waste. So that could be addressing assets to protect the environment or indeed climate change mitigation or indeed their involvement in bioeconomy projects or bioeconomy developments. So across the EU, there's over 3,700 POs operating to date, and that's grown from just over 400 in the early 1990s. So we can see France is at the top of the leader board with just over 750 POs, followed by Germany, Spain, uh, all around the 500 mark, and Portugal then at the bottom around 140. So quite a large number of POs in the continent, which is quite a different number of reasons for this. Uh, I suppose one is the difference and the diverse agri food sectors that we have operating here. So POs are catered for in the CMO, for olive oil, for pig meat, for wine. And as you can see, that will be some of the top products uh, coming out of there, those countries in particular. Also of this 3,700, just over half of them are operating in the fruit and, and vegetable sector. And I suppose the reason why France is at the top of the leaderboard, they're quite strong on their cooperation, particularly within agriculture, uh, as you know, from their gates and from their, their cooperative kumas for their machinery. And so I imagine a lot of these were informal cooperation that was already ongoing before PO legislation was brought into these countries. So it made it for quite, quite a quick transition. The regulation of POs also facilitates this idea of an interbranch organization or an association of POs. So essentially what this allows it's for to facilitate multiple POs to come together and act as one. So it really gives that kind of enhanced scale aspect. So you can see here, it's about members feeding into their regional POs. And when we talk about region, that kind of allows them to keep that local ownership and retain local identities while feeding into that overall kind of arching uh, power machine, I suppose, in terms of, of being able to negotiate with the next stage of the chain. So if we want to think about it in terms of beef, this could be counties joining together, this could be marts joining together to act as POs. So it's different kind of aspects like that, and it gives that added advantage as well. But of course, you also have to operate within the rules. So that's something that members would also need to be cognizant of. So in Ireland, so POs have been legislated for in Ireland since 1996, and that came in with the fruit and vegetable sector. So probably one of the main POs that we would know in here is CMP, CMP in uh, Monham, so to do with the mushrooms. And they were set up in 1999. 
And they had, at that time, they had over 600 producers. Today, they have 60, and they fulfill 85% uh, of their produce is actually going to the UK market at the moment. When we look at the seafood sector, there's five uh, POs operating in here. Uh, for example, the Irish Seafood Fisheries Producer Group, and they can actually avail of a fund to the European Maritime Fisheries Fund, and the fruit and vegetable sector also gets support through the fruit and vegetable operations team also. The dairy sector, they don't have any registered POs, but as we know, cooperatives, there's over 20 of them in operation today. So it is a kind of case that all cooperatives could be POs, but not all POs are cooperatives, if you think about it in that sense. And the beef and veal sector, then the CMO for this at the EU level, it was only opened up in 2013, and it was only legislated for in Ireland here in 2016. So that's when they could start to come together. So as you can see, we only have two here to date, but it is very new at this stage. And uh, speaking with our department of Fishings, I think there's others uh, coming down the pipeline as well for that. But as I mentioned before, the POs in the different sectors operate in different ways and for different sector rules. So that's something that people need to be cognizant of, that it's just not a one size fits all for all the sectors as such. And there are many objectives the PO can engage in, but in certain sectors, this can be more controlled. So, for example, in the beef sector, their sole purpose at the moment is to negotiate on the sale and supply of cattle. So um, previous to the PO rules, there was um, an issue of competition rules of reaching for collective farmers to do this. So the PO does exempt them from that to a certain extent, but this is their main purpose at the moment. Uh, and that's the same goes for the seafood sector POs. So they are supported for the main purpose of creating production and marketing plans. And some of these are still quite new in Ireland's terms. So, you know, this could change obviously in years to come as things, as things advance. So barriers to PO development, what are the kind of the key things that we need to look at here? So I think one of them, and that's for any type of cooperation, is trust and loyalty. Uh, as we know, these are kind of aspects that take quite some years to, to build up. And they're things that actually have the uh, possibility, I suppose, to undermine the credibility of POs. So if you're negotiating and contracting with the processor at the next stage of the chain to have 100 cattle supplied in five months time, and someone decides because they can get a predator price this week to sell 10 of theirs, if you're missing that 10, that that does undermine that credibility. So it is a key and it's something I think that's that's experienced across a lot of groups and in a lot of different countries as well. So it's building that trust and loyalty. We also have aspects then like the aging farming population and part-time nature of farming, which could go against this type of cooperation as well as things like difficulties in securing price information. So for POs to be effective, contracting is a real kind of uh, a need here to deal with the next stages of the chain. And we know that sometimes there is difficulties in securing price information in terms of cost of production, costs of profit margins between processors and retailers in particular, or the costs of actually processing. So these are real issues for PO development as well. Other things such as the availability of supplies, um, for example, particularly in the beef sector, we know that processors might not necessarily want to engage with the PO if they think they can access cattle supplies elsewhere. So it's very much so on the POs to be offering this kind of high quality produce at the right time of the year that, that fits into to their criteria as such. And of course, we don't operate in a vacuum. Uh, there is macroeconomic and market forces, and that we've been looking at Brexit now for the last years, months, days, hours at this stage, and that's going to have a pretty big disruptive impact on the agricultural sector as a whole, and that kind of remains to be seen, but it is something we need to bear in mind as well. So in conclusion, I suppose what we can say is that POs do offer a content for farmers to integrate to the supply chain through economies of scale, and they can also help with that transition from farmers from price takers to price makers. They do have a number of advantages besides this in terms of uh, knowledge transfer aspects, developing higher quality produce, and also in targeting higher value added markets. And as I mentioned before, some would say targeting those more premium markets can give that enhanced buffer because obviously the commodity market can be quite volatile. They also offer this uh, idea of associations of POs or IBOs structure for enhanced scale, because I said that also needs to be in line with the regulations. So that is something that would need to be uh, addressed further within that. But we also have to remember that cooperation is a social process. And as I mentioned, for POs to be recognized, they need to be producer led and built on the initiative of producers. So it's farmers that really don't need to come to the fore here uh, in terms of leading this kind of thing. As I said, these macroeconomics of the forces at the moment are quite strong, but I suppose it can't be said that if this was something in a few years time, I think farmers may indeed 
possibly be better off in a PO because they are a bit more buffered in that sense. But I suppose that does remain to be seen uh, with Brexit at the moment and things like that. So lastly, I just want to acknowledge Chogs and UCC through the Walsh Development, Development Scheme for this uh, project. And of course, I'm happy to take any questions in the panel discussion, but if anyone wants to contact me uh, directly, you can contact me here in my email and all the papers from this uh, are published. So that's it for me. Thank you very much. Well done, Teresa. Thank you very, very much. Yeah, some really interesting aspects to all of this, Teresa, and I suppose to, I suppose, retain or maybe increase the viability of the individual farmer. A couple of interesting questions coming in to you as well um, in relation to how I suppose the small farmer fits into this kind of a supply chain or producer organization. So I'll give you a chance to kind of maybe have a think about that and we can bring it up again in relation to the panel discussion. So for our final presenter today, um, John Moriarty. And John is a Chagas representative with us here today, as well as Anne Kinsella. And uh, John is one of the people involved in uh, the Newbie project, which I'll let John explain about in a minute. But John is an advisor, an advisor in the Newbie project for Chagas, and he's been working on the project for a while. Again, an excellent project that really makes us look at new entrants into farming and new entrants into agriculture. So I let John um, tell us a little bit more about the Newbie project. Perfect. Thanks, Mara. Um, yeah, so um, um, I, as Mara mentioned, my name is John Moriarty and I work with Chagas on the Newbie project. Um, Newbie is a new entrant network. Um, it's a Europe wide project um, supported by um, Horizon 2020. Um, it's been running now for um, three years and will conclude at the end of 2021. Um, as well as ourselves here in Ireland, there are eight other um, EU member states involved in the project. And the overall aim is to set up a network of new entrants, um, a network that, that will help to support uh, future new entrants. So the focus of the project is to disseminate new business models used by new entrants um, to inform future new entrants of ways of overcoming barriers that they face when they start their careers in agriculture. Um, there, there's a range of new entrants out there um, and we, we work with new entrants both to conventional agriculture and um, existing farmers who are diversifying their businesses. And the, we aim to highlight um, these new entrants, focusing on their achievements and their success factors um, as, as they start and, and grow their businesses. So the, our overall goals are to um, show how the businesses have been established, um, learn from the um, existing new entrants um, through a series of case studies. So. Here in Ireland, we have 10 of uh, those case studies completed and we have videos done with um, a good number of those and we'll um, see one of those in detail in a few minutes. And um, then uh, through the case studies, um, highlighting methods um, to overcome uh, challenges. Um, so, you know, uh, challenges would be, for example, access to land or access to finance. And there are some innovative ways out there of of overcoming those barriers and it's to, to learn from those who, who have found innovative ways and, and share those ideas with other people. So um, there, there's a continual need for um, more new entrants. Um, I suppose um, we all know about the, the aging uh, farmer profile in, in Ireland. Um, large number of farmers are over 55 years of age and a very small proportion um, under 35. Um, and as well as that, new entrants bring um, increased innovation, um, increased adoption of, of new ideas, um, maybe more entrepreneurship and, and practical skills um, in, into farm businesses. So. Um, most young farmers now are educated, um, would have come through um, the agricultural colleges or, um, or have done um, other um, education and would be bringing the very latest um, practical skills and information that, that, that would be borne out in research and, and bringing that back to 
to farm. So um, that's a huge positive impact that new entrants have, have on the industry. Um, there's many definitions of new entrants and maybe can often be um, confused with, with um, young farmers maybe, but um, new entrants for the purposes of the newbie project are anybody who starts or becomes involved in a farm business. Um, it can be any type of farm business and uh, they, they can be of any age. And um, typically across Europe, um, we find that new entrants face a series of common challenges um, and the, the most prevalent of these are access to land, um, access to capital, access to information and access to markets. So um, in the newbie project, then we en we're engaged in activities such as the case studies that I've mentioned. Um, we have an online database, um, which is um, the development of, of our new intern network. So if anybody's interested, feel free to uh, pop on the newbie website and, and register there for updates. And we also have a video channel. Um, we, we arrange visits between countries uh, to learn from each other. Um, we do regional discussion circles um, throughout the country to get insights from new entrants that, that feed back into the project. And um, we're currently engaged in developing a toolkit that will help to support new entrants in, in the future. And um, another big part of the project is new entrant competitions. Um, we're currently finalizing this year's one and this year is our winner from last year. Um, Stephen Ryan from County Galway, who um, was a new entrant um, snail farmer. So he'd um, added snail production to his beef and sheep farm to make it more viable for him and his family into the future. And um, our case studies are collated on, on our website in a, an easy to use uh, map. So um, anybody that, that's interested can uh, look those up there. So um, in the newbie project, we've we've come across a lot of uh, collaborative farming arrangements, and um, they're very useful methods of of uh, farm transfer for younger people to to get access to land. And um, maybe I'll, I'll just um, run through some some of those examples with you now. Um, the first picture here is um, Padraig and Patrick O'Farrell. Um, they're um, one of our case studies and um, they set up a, a family farm partnership um, to allow Podrick to get into the business while Patrick remained um, involved in the business and taking a, an income from the business. So it, it has allowed them both to work on the same farm and, um, and both um, earn an income. So um, maybe just to start by um, going through the benefits of collaborative farming. Um, it's become very popular here in Ireland. Um, so from an economic point of view, um, those who are involved in collaborative arrangements have the ability to increase their profitability and competitiveness. Um, similar to the Farrells there, they're able to create uh, efficiencies of scale um, with lower capital costs um, as they grow the business. And um, um, new entrants into the business could bring new, um, new skills. Um, from the social perspective, um, it gives a better work-life balance to the existing farmer with, with um, more help on, on the farm, um, reducing stress and um, health and safety um, also improves when there's um, more than one person working on the farm at a time. So um, the more dangerous tasks um, probably be, become safer. Um, also, there's um, positive impacts on environmental sustainability and the adoption of new technology. So some of the reasons why um, collaborative farming has become so essential, um, you know, we've shortages of skilled labor, um, there's issues with um, farm fragmentation, um, the avail availability of, of land and uh, the age status of farmers. And 
um, collaborative arrangements then are seen to give you know economic, social, and environmentally sustainable farms. So I've um, just put together here an example um, of a of a typical farm partnership arrangement. So um, you here you have the existing farmer who um, the in this family situation could be the um, the parent. Um, and you have the young trained farmer who's maybe a son or daughter that has um, finished education and is looking to get back into the farm. Um, there's a number of options um, there, um, eventually leading to inheritance. So I suppose the, the most direct option is um, gift or inheritance of the farm. But in many cases, the existing farmer is not in a position to do that yet. Maybe there is... Um, other siblings to be supported and um, they, they need to uh, remain involved in the farm. So that's where um, arrangements such as the registered farm partnership come in. Um, it gives both a stake in the business um, and allows them to farm together, both taking a, an income um, that, that's agreed beforehand uh, percentage wise. And following on then from the registered farm partnership, um, there there could be a gift or inheritance again of, of the land, or maybe um, the they decide to progress into a succession farm partnership, and this succession partnership sets out the the timeline for transfer of the land, um, with, with a certain proportion of the farm being transferred. Um, by a certain timeline. So it gives everybody a structure and uh, a sense of security going forward. So that's a, a, a tip, what's often a typical family situation um, here in Ireland. So um, in, in other um, instances then, you might have the existing farmer and the young trained farmer who is not actually a relation of the existing farmer. So. Um, in some cases, they, when they come together, they might look at um, um, options for them. So um, these can include um, entering a registered farm partnership. Um, that, that's an option um, outside of the family as well. Um, a very common um, route to go in, in dairy farming at the moment actually is uh, share farming. And then there's also long-term land leasing. So I'll, um, I'll, I'll go through the details of each of those um, now. So um, the registered farm partnership, the, the benefits of, of that include um, the integration of new IDs and skills into the business, um, the sharing of the workload, um, you know, in, in the family, instance there you have the father and the son working together and um, that reduces the um, social isolation element um, there's an enhanced work-life balance for both parties uh, um, and there's great opportunities then to increase scale and for the young person to drive on the business while, while they have the assistance of, of the, the more experienced farmer to guide them along and I suppose the 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 big incentives with registered farm partnerships are um, the range of taxation incentives that are out there and the scheme benefits that are available to um, to both the, the existing farmer and 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 the new entrant. So I um I have a video here from one of our case studies. Um, this is James and Edmund Goff. Um, who farm in in what in County Waterford, and they um they entered the farm partnership a few years ago. Um, it has allowed them to to grow their business and um consolidate their business greatly. So there is benefits. There's you can get away for weekend. You can have a life. The farm I uh, inherited from my father, uh, mid eighties. Um, uh, he was in ill health, so the, it was natural progression. 
Uh, that time they were going into sucklers at that stage. Uh, there used to be a few milking cows here before that, but too small, like you know. So they went into sucklers and you just buy a few cattle and do a bit of deal. And so that was it. Uh, I suppose when I took over, there was 80 acres, and uh, I bought uh, part of an uncle's place in the early 90s, and uh, 20 acres. There's a guts of 100 acres, roughly. I was I was I was a carpenter by trade. Uh, building went quite. Uh, probably found myself at home with not a whole pile to do. I was putting down time, I was clearing land and reclaiming a bit of ground and just making making good of it. So we reclaimed a lot of a hill up there and I was renting, I had the green cert done in a evening courses uh, along with work. So we, uh, I rented a bit of land bounding us here at home, came up and to the margin of land and I rented it and had got my own herd number. Yeah, you want plenty of time. We were very tight to deadlines when we when we started off going into partnership. So like, didn't the thing that you decide today and it will happen tomorrow. When uh, when we went into partnership, I was in schemes, like you know, and you you, you weren't finished or you were, you were after starting, like you know, and that created a small few problems, like you know, to, to link them in together. Other than that, it's worked out well. This will be our third year in the partnership now, and I suppose we've built up the herd too. We've 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 got over 50 cows calving this year, uh, about 40 calves at present, and I suppose the sheep. Then there's the guts of 100 sheep breeding yours, give or take. We're still working, uh, both working full-time jobs as well as farming here. If 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 one of us wanted away for a weekend, there there is the, there is the other one there to pick up the slack or or look after things. So there is benefits. There's you can get away for a weekend, you can have a life, you can go to a match, you can get away and do something. You're not tied to the thing full time. The main benefits of the newbie project are you're kind of improving the look of the place and trying to see what other people are at and different different ideas. From my point of view, like it was grand to see the farm staying in the family name, continuing on the tradition and uh, like uh, by enhancing it, James is uh, going in the direction I'd love to see it going, like you know. Okay, so that was um, James and Edmund there. Um, a great example of a of a partnership um, working for both. Um, I suppose there's two elements to this. Um, it has allowed um, James had his had his own farm established, um, but maybe didn't have all the facilities here required. So it allowed James and Edmund to come together um, for James to use Edmund's facilities and for them both to have. Uh, one herd of cattle and one herd of um, sheep um, really streamlining their, their work processes as opposed to having um, having two flocks and two herds um, w within the one family so um, that that's that's uh, this is an example where I suppose some of the features from the typical family farm partnership and from the typical non-family partnership um, ha have have come together in in, in one so um there's just a um two other collaborative arrangements in that we we often encounter um they're share farming so this is um two separate businesses coming together on the one farm um it involves a, an agreement between the the owner and and the share farmer um it means that extra labor becomes available to the landowner and the, the share farmer, who is the, the new entrant essentially, ha, um, gets a stake in the business, um, which would give a, a greater level of interest in, in progressing the business as opposed to somebody um, working for a wage. Um, it in, share farming enables the, the share farmer um, to, to access, um, to get access to land in the first place and then to build their equity and put them in a position in the future to, to progress onto land ownership. And the typical example that we would see is maybe where the, the landowner would um, supply the land and the infrastructure, while the share farmer would bring stock and, and their own labor um, to the farm. And another collaborative arrangement then is uh, long-term land leasing. So um, this is a situation where land is leased for more than five years. Um, it's a legal agreement that's uh, stamped by revenue. 
Um, there are several benefits. Um, so the benefits to the lessee um, include security of tenure. Um, so this allows, allows them to um, justify financial investments in the farming in the farm, such as receding, um, putting in grazing infrastructure, um, water systems, etc. And um, it, it also, as well as um, getting access to land, it can often facilitate additional um, access to facilities such as animal housing. Uh, benefits into the lessor who is leasing out the land. Um, it gives an opportunity to step back from the farm while ma maintaining their income from the land. Um, there's there's an incentive there for for the the lessee to improve the land in that they they have a, a long uh, a longer tenure as opposed to con acre. So um, that that has benefits for the lessor as well in in that the land will be maintained and possibly improved during the lease. And there's um, some very good income tax incentives there as well for the lessor. So in summary, um, the Nubia project um, is a project that aims to demonstrate entry routes into agriculture um, to assist new entrants and to develop a Europe-wide network of new entrants um, who, who, can, who can learn from each other. And in terms of collaboration there, um, collaboration um, is very useful to facilitate land access for new entrants and, and, and to promote um, farm transfer and as well as a more timely uh, farm transfer and um, gives access routes for new entrants um, who re are often referred to as landless new entrants. So those from outside of, of uh, farms who who would like to, to embark on a career in agriculture. So, um, yeah, uh, thank you very much for your attention. John, thanks a million. That, the, uh, some really interesting stuff, really interesting material coming out of the new bee project. You know, we really need, I suppose, to demonstrate these new entry routes into agriculture, into farming. And particularly, we need to demonstrate how young people can get involved in agriculture. And I think that idea of a landless new entrant is a real, um, I, I suppose it really highlights exactly what we're talking about in relation to our um, conference today and our presentation. This idea of trying to, I suppose, bring in the new entrants into agriculture, bring them into new areas, but also how can they get access to land if this is what they actually want to do. So I suppose what we'll do now is we might actually maybe get Anne and Teresa on board as well. And Ashling and Shane and John have already joined us. And um, we might spend a few minutes maybe just discussing some of the issues that have arisen via the questions and answers, but also maybe some of the issues that might have arisen via your own interpretation of some of the other presentations or some of the key issues that you think are really important for us today in, in going forward for ruralization and everything else. Um, I think Shane, there's a couple of questions there, but maybe before I go to Shane, and there was one question there that I think um, it might be interesting for you. Um, this idea of, um, um, yeah, you know, about the financial needs of farmers in later years for their household needs and how this plays out as far as older farmers willing willingness to pass on the farm. Shane, I might come to you in a minute from that, but maybe from a financial perspective, Anne, would you have any idea in relation to this? question. Yeah, Maura, uh, thanks for that. Um, yeah, there's a number of interrelated issues in that. And I think there's another question that's kind of related to this area as well with regard to, to low incomes in agriculture. As we know, particularly in the dry stock sector, um, um, low incomes are persistent in, in that sector. And in the 2019 year, the average income in, say, the, the cattle rearing um, is only 9,000 9, euro per farm. So um, there's issues with regard to the persistent low income, which is unique to the farm business. That doesn't really happen in other um, business models. So many farms also have to rely on their off-farm income with 43% having an off-farm job. So in order for succession to take place and somebody being able to hand over the farm, further plans and incentives definitely need to be put in place to allow the older farmers to retire as it's impossible for farmers to have sufficient income 
to pay into private um, pension schemes um, over their lifetime and even making voluntary PRSI contributions of the 500 euro per annum is out of reach of many farmers. Um, if their income is only 5% or, or 5,000 per year, well, then that means that the PRSI contributions alone equates to 10% of their income. So, so that is a lot for a farmer to, to have to pay. So that is one issue with regard to farmers being able to pay the voluntary contributions um, in order um, to be able to, to avail of a contributory pension and to their old age. Um, also, there was research that we undertook with, with Brian Leonard um, in UIG, uh, Chagas um, undertook research with Brian Leonard, where we looked at the life cycle analysis and looking at income streams over the lifetime of a farm and differences in the dry stock farms versus the dairy farms. And this really highlighted the challenges uh, faced by many farms um, who generate low income over their lifetime. And really, in this case, the farm is the retirement plan for, for many farmers. So without the farm income and the direct payments um, in, in their retirement, many farmers would not be able to survive on, on the old age pension alone. And um, I, I, I think there's somebody mentioned as well with regard to the housing element and the farmhouse with the farm you know, what happens in relation to that issue. So there's a lot of interrelated issues, but um, thankfully in Ireland, I think we have done a, a lot of research in relation to the older farmers and their needs and wants. And I think um, Shane is probably the best person to maybe discuss that further. But we've also looked at the younger farmers and what their needs and wants are. And it's trying to align um, the needs and wants of both groups, I suppose, and see what policies and incentives can be made available in order to encourage the, the, the handing over of the reins over a period of time rather than it being just at, at, a, at a point in time. Yeah, and thanks a lot for that. There's some, some good information there. Shane, I suppose looking at this issue as well in relation to your research and this idea that, of course, financial issues are of huge consideration, and you probably would have found this as well, but you also found that emotive issues are as important. Yeah, 100 percent. And thanks, Anne, for building the context from a financial uh, perspective. But I found that, you know, when I'm talking about my research, you know, talking about over 900 farmers surveyed through Chagas, very helpful all along. So it's a national representative sample plus in-depth interviews. So you're really getting a, a really good insight into what, how farmers are feeling, older farmers. So my, my research essentially gives older farmers a voice in this generation renewal policy. Um, up until, you know, my research essentially, but when I started, there was very little out there. So the previous retirement scheme, for example, for farmers, uh, one of the terms and conditions was those intending to retire under the scheme must cease all agricultural activity forever. So if I ever had to kind of justify why I did what I did, you can put it on that piece of policy. So, of course, um, there's issues in relation to, you know, what happens next financially, but a lot of farmers, you know, they... Their, their priority was to continue farming and uh, their priority was to have animals, to go to the mart, to share experiences, to have chats, social outlets with other farmers. And, you know, going on holidays, whatever was was all well and good, but they'd be looking forward to getting back to the farm. So it, it, it didn't really, the financial side of it was, of course, important to live, but the social side of it and the emotional attachment, there's a, a really strong uh, link towards their their well-being their emotional well-being and their their way of life so um of course the the theme of this presentation is predominantly about the younger farmers and how do we facilitate access to land and of course uh, i had to take the approach then that uh, this has to happen so um if we it's about food production essentially in the long run so how do we address the needs of the older generation in a sensitive manner that will maintain their existing way of life and john talked about that the partnerships they're all very essential ex they will give that kind of a a model but yet there's also dynamics involved uh, at a more kind of a human level that there's power dynamics there's the, the conversations need to be had. Um, of course, the well-informed, someone mentioned, I think it was Olivia, that yeah, the, it's further well-informed, but yet if we take the approach that if it's linked towards education, if it's linked towards eligibility for farm partnerships, it takes the taboo away from this. It brings it into a more normalized mindset that this is just what happens. We have to have this chat in order to be trained as a young farmer or to be available to be eligible for a partnership. So. 
Yeah, it's 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 a complex issue. There's no doubt. And Abraham talked about, you know, is there any workshops? This research has been published widely academically, which is all well and good. But Chagas have been really helpful as the dissemin ve dissemination vehicle towards the, the farm level. They've published this extensively in their tea research magazines. And from that has been picked up in the farming media. And it was only when it's picked up in the farming media that you get emails from Brussels, for example, or the Department of Agriculture, because if it's coming from the farm level, they can't ignore it. This is what the farmers are saying. So, you know, it's there's no doubt there's the social, emotional, financial side of all this. But I think in Ireland, we have a good grasp of it all, and it is going to improve policy moving forward. And hopefully we'll never be left in a place like the previous retirement scheme, asking farmers to just kind of completely rethink their whole way of life which was which was wrong so that's uh, kind of an overview of that absolutely shane absolutely it was a policy i think that very rightly they got rid of fairly quickly because it really wasn't suitable for um the farmer or the time at, at, the, at the particular time i suppose in thinking um maybe Teresa, just to come to you for a minute i suppose this idea of once we actually make that break and get farmers in via what john was talking about the newbie projects or what shane is talking about via succession and there's a question there in relation to i suppose the producer organizations how do you integrate the smaller farmer into the value chain? You know, I think sometimes when you think about the producer organizations, you often think about the very productive farmer that's becoming involved in these value chains and who are able, I suppose, to integrate themselves into these producer organizations. But what do you think about the smaller farmer? How can the smaller farmer, the new young farmer get involved in producer organizations or supply chains? Okay, yeah, absolutely. Well, as I mentioned in the presentation, for POs, first of all, to be recognised, they have to be producer-led, and that's kind of a key aspect. So I think one of the good things that can be done is actually to build on existing networks. It's very hard to start uh, from ground zero in some aspects. So it can be things like KT groups. So even in my research, that was an aspect of existing networks that could already be there, whether it was through VTAP or whatever, that can go ahead and come together. They're existing. So it is something that they can build on. Also, there was a fear, I suppose, when I was focusing on the beef research, obviously because POs were going to be negotiating with processors, well, where does that leave the livestock mart? And if they're not going to put their cattle through the mart anymore, are they just going to go straight to the processors? So they're set up administratively to actually function as POs. And I think that's quite an, a, an important factor for any POs to set up, that they have that administration element as well, that they manage sales, that they manage negotiation on behalf of the farmers, because they do have to be organized to integrate into these supply chains and value chains. When we're looking at value chains, we're looking at that equitable distribution of profits, of course. And I think for products and for to integrate, they're looking for, in terms of processes and retailers now, they're looking for that higher quality product. So that's what farmers need to come together on. So it's not necessarily that it needs to be big farmers to come together, but it needs to be a lot of farmers to just create a critical mass that can get into and access those markets. And they have to be offering something a little bit different, I think, whether it is higher quality produce or sustainability credentials that can actually be backed up. And we've seen more and more that kind of aspect of storytelling and that branding that also has a part to play. Um, so really, it's about getting that collective together first and foremost. And it's not about offering a whole range of products. It's kind of start small and offer that something different and then build on that as such. Um, but partnering, of course, with different uh, different stages of the chain. So it might not just be the processor, but, but with the retailer, like what in my case study in the US was, was that whole partnership approach across. So you're looking for someone there that has the shared values I suppose, of your PO, you know, that they're setting to that type of consumer, that that processor processes those type of products for them and will work with you. So it's a very integral, and I suppose I forgot to mention in my presentation as well, for the BPOs in Ireland, they can't, they can't at the moment draw down any support from a fund, but there is a fund there from the Royal Development Fund. They do provide up to €3,000 for to facilitate new POs to come together to integrate the supply chain. So there is facilitators supported through that. So for any POs that are looking to get set up, look at the Department of Agriculture website page. Uh, there's contacts there in the department and they'll be able to steer you in that direction as well. Thanks, Teresa. And I suppose that kind of multi-actor kind of approach to what you're talking about, that kind of need for sustainability and multifunctionality. Ashling, just I suppose it leads me on to the question that's there in relation to uh, this holistic approach and how can this be incorporated into policy through I suppose cross uh, departmental teamwork. Do you any uh, any answer in relation to that question, Ashling? Yeah, I think it kind of um, 
chimes into what everybody has been saying that um, there are so many factors to consider, be it the cultural or the environmental, and how do we kind of bring all these together across um, different departmental objectives and tick all the boxes for, for everybody. It has to be part of, I guess, the way forward. And it just brings kind of my mind back to, I think, one of the earlier questions around um, a potential alternative or a new policy logic. And maybe um, that's where some of this thinking needs to come from is, is that kind of intervention lo logic from the very, very highest level that results in or drives the kind of uh, cross, um, cross departmental, cross sectoral, <laughs> holistic uh, approach, if, if, if it's ever um, achie achievable. Um, in some way, of course, we have to um, aim for it, but um, I think that's part of the big kind of challenge that ruralization is trying to face as well. And um, perhaps it's something that it's a long term challenge as well. Like we're talking about working together across so many areas, but it's a, a huge shift that's needed. And maybe it's a, a longer term approach in terms of this um, new uh, uh, policy agenda. But, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Absolutely, Ashling, And I, I suppose, um, John, just to come to you, I'm kind of conscious of the time. I don't want to go too much over time because um, people log on nowadays for a certain amount of time and I don't want to take any more time uh, uh, from them than we need. But John, just to bring you into the discussion just before we finish, um, I suppose in, in, in thinking about that kind of diversification, that kind of need to change, that kind of need for viability, and I suppose thinking about new farmers and new entrants into farming, um, John, I suppose diversification is not something maybe in the past that we've been um, hugely um, open to here in Ireland. You know, there have been Chaga studies that showed that we are not as open to diversifying the farms as they are in Europe. In relation to diversification, have you seen a switch in this kind of thinking, particularly for new entrants coming into uh, farming, coming into agriculture, maybe new entrants that now have access to land? Is there, is there a more openness to diversification? Yes, I, I think so, Maura. Um, you know, when we were putting together the case studies for the project, um, a good number of, of those that, um, that came onto our radar were um, or farms that have di diversified. So, you know, you might have younger new entrants coming in who look at the farm before they take over and decide that they need to do something different from the previous generation to make it viable for themselves. And then there's others who, um, you know, have been farming for some time and um, maybe haven't been making enough to keep themselves on the land full time and have de decided to diversify and add value to their products uh, and and oftentimes di direct sell their products to the customer. So um, yeah, it's definitely something that's, um, that's growing in popularity. And even in running our discussion circles, it's a question I've asked some of them and um, up to two thirds of some of the groups, the participants have, um, have taught about diversification at some stage and, and considered it as a possibility. So um, yeah, I think it's something that's definitely growing. Excellent. Um, I suppose just before we finish, um, there are still uh, two or three outstanding questions there. If anybody wants to jump in for definite, either that or we can answer them. I know there's a couple of tax questions there in relation to now. And you did mention um, Brian Leonard's work earlier on, which deals quite specifically with um, further issues of taxation in and around um, uh, succession. So again, what we might do is we might put up some of those papers on the website for people and we might put up further links that may answer some of the questions that we haven't dealt with already. And we can also make um, Shane's papers and, and Teresa's and of course the links to the newbie project and all of the links to the ruralization projects available, which may answer some of the questions that we haven't had time to deal with so far. Um, but I, I am conscious of not running too far over on time. So I think we may leave the discussion and the questions at, at that, if that's okay to everybody. But just before we finish, I want to um, pay particular tribute, first of all, to my colleagues in the National Rural Network, um, 
Shane and Teresa, which are two of those. And in the behind scenes today, um, James Claffey, who's the manager of the National Rural Network, and I want to pay tribute and sincere thanks to James for putting a lot of this online um, uh, scenario together for us today and for dealing with the technical ends of everything as well. Um, I particularly want to thank uh, the speakers, um, Anne, who, who started off after I gave my introduction to um, ruralization. Shane, who gave us an, an excellent overview, as always, on succession and inheritance. And uh, Ashling, who carried on with areas in and around uh, the work that we've done so far on uh, the ruralization, particularly the innovative land practices at European level. And Teresa, who gave us, again, an excellent overview of the potential of producer organizations. And um, finally, to John, whose newbie project really ties in quite well with some of the issues that we're dealing with in ruralization and I think it raises a real issue for us for people who are involved with research and people who are involved with research projects that there are real collaborations between the work that we are doing between the work that we are doing in the national rural network in ruralization the Chagas are doing in their area that the newbie project is doing as well so I think bringing this collaboration to answer some of the questions that we have here in Ireland about new entrants, about access to land, about succession inheritance, it's really important. And I think it's important from the perspective of driving forward ideas that have been raised through the questions and answers and through the presentations and to make sure that these ideas and some of the answers that we have for these ideas are brought forward for policy and makers and the policy environment. But also, I suppose, keeping in mind the people on the ground, the everyday people that are working in these areas, the key stakeholders, the practitioners that are working in these areas as well, as well as the farmers and as well as the new entrants and young people trying to get access to land in relation to Ireland. So um, I think uh, without further ado, again, I want to thank everybody and I want to thank James and the National Rural Network. And for any of the material that we've talked about, please log on to the National Rural Network site or ruralization. And a lot of the work that we're producing at the moment in ruralization will be available on the website after Christmas. Some of the reports that we've produced in NUI Galway on the conceptual framework and the assessment framework and the areas that Ashling has mentioned as well. Those will all be available. So for now, thank you very much for tuning in. You, the audience, most definitely. Thanks a million for tuning in for some of the great questions that you have uh, posed today. And uh, please log on to our websites for any of the additional information. Thank you all. And I wish you all a very happy Christmas and a safe, free of COVID Christmas, as well as everything else. Thank you very much. Goremina Margaret.